What an amazing race, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so pleased with the team. It's been one of the most amazing comebacks ever, I think, almost in any sport, but certainly in sailing. It's teamwork, these teams, you know. It's like um, it's sailing's version of Formula One. So you go out there, you've got, uh, you're struggling for speed. You've got to go back, work with the designers, work out how you're going to get the boat going faster. That race today, that was one of the toughest races I've ever sailed physically. And, you know, the guys did an amazing job to get a boat around the track. Well, it's Ben Ainsley speaking as he came off the water in San Francisco in 2013, having been part of the team that won the America's Cup for USA Team Oracle. This weekend marks the start of the 35th America's Cup, and less than two years on from that historic victory, Sir Ben is back. This time with his own team and a goal to claim the world's oldest sporting trophy for Great Britain. The 35th America's Cup has started. The H2O Show on BBC Radio Solent. Good afternoon, I'm Robin Knox Johnston. And I'm Shelley Drury Lee. And this week the programme is in Portsmouth as the opening event in the America's Cup World Series draws to a close. You know, it's a one thing really that is missing from our very proud maritime heritage and being based here in Portsmouth now, we want to bring the America's Cup back to where it all started and that's our goal, that's what we work towards every day. We're racing for points here. It's important that we go out with our best foot forwards and, and uh, race hard and get some decent results. Well, Shelley, the weather has obviously taken a turn for the worst. Neil's been chatting with the event director, Leslie Greenhouch. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking to make this decision today, but everything is about public safety, and that's, that's our primary number one decision. Um, you know, all the sailors who were there, we, we had a big meeting this morning about the conditions. We thought, with our meteorologist's advice, we could get a, a race in earlier. So we moved the racing schedule forward to 12. And actually, when the boats were on the outer moorings ready to go, we had a 40 knot gust. And so, you know, it, it's a fairly simple decision, to be honest, once you reach that stage. So very disappointed. I, and is it the safety of the crews on the water as well? Because the layman would say you actually need wind to be able to sail. It is the safety of the crews. You know, for those of you who got the chance to see the boats, um, you know, they're, they're big old beasts. And they, there is a wind limit between 6 knots and 25 knots for racing. 25 knots is the upper limit. Um, and we were, you know, well in excess of that, 30-plus knots today. Um, so it, then it becomes the safety not only of the crews but also of all the marshals and all the volunteers we have on the water. Um, you know, there's a, there's a big entourage and people coming out to watch the racing in their own boats. You suddenly put quite a lot of people at risk. You know, people are passionate passionate fans and they go out there hail rain or snow and, and we just you know we have a responsibility to act in a safe manner we work alongside QHM at the Royal Navy and you know so their advice is is pretty solid as well so so they were they were very happy with that we made the right decision so have today's races been cancelled or postponed uh, today's races have been cancelled so um, they, there, there is no weather wind coming in now that shows us a glimpse of racing we, we talked about that at about well just before I came here um, and yeah, it's, it's not likely to happen now. It's, it's, if anything, the wind will get stronger this afternoon and then tomorrow also looks fairly hideous. So, um, but, but, you know, I'm still living on the, the highs of yesterday when we had fantastic sunshine. I've never had such a great day. So that's, that's the memory for me. So the bottom line is then yesterday's results stand, which means... Ben Ainsley Racing has won the first leg of the America's Cup World Series. Exactly, so that's definitely something to celebrate. Um, so yes, and the, the two races count, um, two races can make a series, so the first Louis Vuitton America's Cup World Series is now complete. Um, we have a winner, and that's Land Rover BAR, and we're, we're over the moon, it's the home team. Um, so many supporters came out to support them, and you know, so it's, it's a great start to the, the World Series. In a month's time, they move to Gothenburg. So the second World Series event happens in Gothenburg, bank holiday weekend at the end of August. So we'll all be waiting with bated breath to see, uh, see what happens in the second event. And let's just celebrate what happened here yesterday. What a day. It was just simply amazing. <laughs> Everything played. You know, you had to write your perfect day as a, a serious extreme to today. <laughs> you'd, you'd have had yesterday. And, and we, you know, can you just simply imagine if we'd had four days like yesterday? I think it would have been amazing. But, but that's not to be. And, you know, we've learned a lot um, through what, you know, both yesterday and today. We saw the numbers of people who were out supporting and watching and being enthusiastic. And it was really fantastic. 52,000 people lining the seafront here, watching a history being made. It's the first time America's Cup racing happened in the Solent for over 160 years, and, and what a day for them. 
yeah no it was it was simply glorious great wind great views you know over 2,000 boats on the water as you say 50 plus thousand on shore media in here it was rammed and um, we had you know some guests in our sponsor guests on the front great commentary big screens you know there was something and then there was our great concert last night so it was it was top to tail it was perfect perfection yesterday and how's Portsmouth been as a um, as a host venue, weather aside? Well, yeah, weather aside, Portsmouth has been so welcoming. And I've been working with Portsmouth, with the City Council and the Navy and a lot of the stakeholders since last November. So um, I've spent a lot of time in Portsmouth and, and I couldn't, you know, there's, I can't find any fault. They, they're super enthusiastic, super supportive. You know, today is a classic example, very, very challenging day. Um, you know, you need to get the council and the stakeholders, the Royal Navy, together, sit at a table and make some big decisions quickly. And that, that happened perfectly. So from an event control point of view, from an emergency planning point of view, all of those good things came together really well. So that's, that's really important as well. And of course, now we're looking ahead locally, um, 12 months time for the 2016 races. Yep, very much so. We'll be back um, bigger and brighter next year. Um, the 21st to the 24th of July next year is the, is the corresponding Thursday to Sunday. So we will be here and, you know, we, we thank everyone for turning up and we look forward to seeing them all again and, and plus some next year. That was Neil Sackley talking to Leslie Greenhouch. Robin, I am sulking because this was my first ever America's Cup race today and I was so excited and, and now it's just all gone to pop. I, I think, Sherry, an awful lot of people from Portsmouth and around the Solent will also be disappointed, but I also think they'll be realistic. They'll look out at that weather. That was playing over a four six. You're not going to take boats out with a fixed mainsail. You can't reef it. You're not going to take them out in this sort of weather because you're asking for people to get hurt or even worse. So I think exactly the right decision has been made. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're in the media centre here and, and we feel at any moment now this actual, this, uh, you know, temporary media centre building, which is very sturdy, looks like it's going to take off. So I totally understand, you know, where they're coming from. But, I mean, the trouble is, as I've heard all about yesterday from Neil, our producer, from all the tweets, from all the Facebooks, and it was fantastic. What did I miss? Well, what you missed, I think, is a foretaste of what this event is going to develop into. While we have all the teams together, before we start the match rating phase, which is much further down the line, and that's one boat against another boat, just the two boats, we're team racing here. And what we saw was some brilliant action on the water. And the fascinating thing was, you, it was very difficult to tell until they came together at the ends. They had to go through a sort of narrow gap. They all had to go through it. Who had actually grabbed an advantage during the leg from one end of the course to the other? And it was utterly fascinating watching the tactics being used, the sailing being used. The weather was perfect. It was the perfect wind for these sort of boats. Sometimes they were falling, sometimes they weren't. But just watching them all out there in action. And you realise that, actually, the gap between them is very, very narrow. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, actually, because this is the first time, they, over the last uh, what, 18 months since the, since the last race or last time they were all together, they've all been working on their tactics and their design and everything. They've all been busying away on their computers, practising. This is the first time that they've actually sort of all come on the start line together and nobody else knew what the other country had done. So um, was it a real sort of test yesterday to see actually who has got the skill and the advantage. I think that summarises it perfectly. That's exactly what it was yesterday. And all of us were on tenterhooks seeing how well is Ben Ainsley Racing going to be doing against yeah. the other people. Because all the boats are the same. But, you know, it's not till later on they start building their own boats, which is what Ben's got a whole team working on now. There's the science going into it. So at this point, it's just down to the skill and the tactics of the team. Mm -hmm. And I think what I found so encouraging was the way Ben came through on top. I felt that he was just showing us everything he's used over the years to get in five Olympics, five medals, oh, you know, yes. four goals. He just came through and, and I thought, you know, against really top international competition, mm -hmm. we all know the names of these guys, we all in sailing, we all know these guys, we know how good they are. Ben, nevertheless, managed to get a first and a second. And I took a great deal of encouragement from that. And that is down to Ben and his team. Well, talking of the legend, here he is, Ben. You caught up with him earlier, didn't you, Robin? I did too. I mean, you must have mixed emotions because 
yesterday you were stamping your authority on the others. The first and the second, the first time you've been out as a team. And sadly, we've lost the racing today. Yeah, we would have loved to sell today because we've been training quite a lot in the breeze and felt like we were going well. We got the boat handling sorted out and we would have liked to have gone out and, and had a good crack at it. But, it, yeah, it just as you know, it's just too much for these kind of boats today. You would have been out there, you, Ocean, going to say, you probably think we're a bunch of wimps. But and not with a fixed wing uh, sail, yeah, I wouldn't. Not with a fixed wing sail, exactly. Yeah. Now, I, I walked along coming here and I thought, they're going to cancel. Yeah. There's just too much wind out there. Yeah. It wouldn't have been safe, would it? No, it wouldn't have been safe. And as you say, with these boats, with a fixed wing sail, they are dangerous boats and you have to respect that. Absolutely. Well, I watched it yesterday and... I have to say, I was on the fort, and I have to say it was brilliant racing. I mean, but it was very hard to tell actually who got the lead because you all sort of split up and then you come together. Oh, Ben's overtaken him, or yeah. this has happened. I mean, what was it like on the boat? Did you feel that? Did you feel you weren't quite sure where the others were? Yeah, absolutely. It was very changeable conditions. As you're saying, very puffy and shifty, and quite often getting the sail choice with the code zero down when sail was pretty critical. So, yeah, we had changes places were changing all of the time and our guys did a really good job with the boat handling and Giles Scott on the tactics trying to get us in the best best bit of win and that really pulled us through and certainly that last race got us through to that crucial second place which gave us the overall win well that was good but I did notice Ben you were doing slightly better against the others on the windward legs than the leeward legs right yeah well maybe yeah, I don't you mean, I haven't really had time to analyse the racing but that might be the case but uh, yeah, we, we've, I mean, I was really ple pleased with how the guys sailed and they're so excited to have won on home waters in front of a home crowd. I think it was wonderful. Really, but, so now, the uh, team will feel pretty bucked by this result because first time out, new team, yeah. first time you've raced competitively against the others. Yeah. So that's really good for your morale, isn't it? I mean, It is. It's a huge momentum for us now. We've got this new facility here in Portsmouth. We've got all our designers and boat builders working really long hours to get our next testing boat on the water. So I think for them, it gives them a lot of confidence to see us out there representing the team and they feel that that work and that effort is going to be worthwhile. Well, we're rooting for you in Gothenburg. Yeah, thanks, go, Robin. Go for it, Ben. Thanks, mate. Good Take to see care. you. Sir Ben Ainsley chatting with Sir Robin just a few moments ago. Robin, he didn't seem that disappointed, quite upbeat. I, I thought he was looking very confident, actually, and uh, you know, he's done well, and he, he and his team will be taking that onward. It's a great boost for their morale. Good news. Great news, Robin. So what are, we, what are we hearing about in the next hour? Well, we're going to hear from some of those who not only made this event possible, but are building and working with the team. We hear how Ben Ainsley Racing is working with local colleges in a legacy project that is set to last for years and how this event is helping youngsters to get a real taste of life on the water. H2O on BBC Radio Solent. Well, Paul Campbell-James is a name that we're familiar to many in sailing with his background in both mono and multi hull racing. He was part of the Italian challenge for the 33rd and 34th campaigns. And now he's a major part of the British campaign. Shelley's been chatting to him. It's the thing you dream of when you're a youngster is to win the America's Cup. But, you know, to be in a part and be in a position where you could win it for a British team is a whole other level, you know, and it's... Um, yeah, it's a fantastic position we're in and we're really looking forward to the future. So where's your history, Paul? You yep. know, why did Ben call you up? Well, I grew up sailing kind of five years behind Ben the whole time and kind of followed in his footsteps, really. So started, you know, with the with the Optimist and then into, into bigger boats after that. But um, the last America's Cup I did with uh, the Italians, obviously Ben was with the Americans. Um, oh, so you were actually competing against well, him? Well, to be honest, he was, he was the defender. So he was um, in the America's Cup where we were second behind the New Zealanders in the Louis Vuitton. So we never actually raced each other, but, um, <laughs> you know, we got close. <laughs> but, yeah, so we raced against each other and we did the Extreme Series and um, won that in 2010 and 2011 um, with Luna Rossa and with the Omani team the year before that. So. How different is Extreme Sailing to the America's Cup Sailing? I mean, t t to the layman, the boats look similar. You know, they're all on the edge, they're, they're, they're radical sailing boats, but it's obviously a completely different technique or not? Uh, Technique-wise, it's not too different. I mean, there's um, the difference is these boats are twice the speed. You know, so they, the Extreme Series has got a reputation for being very crash and burn and, you know, the lots of collisions, and which is fantastic to watch. Sounds like powerboat racing. Yeah. So, yeah, brilliant. Home there. <laughs> exactly. Um, the America's Cup is, is kind of that turboed. You know, it's um, we go... 
we'd do 40 miles an hour all approaching the same mark at the same time and you know it takes a lot of skill for the from the helmsman and the crew to to make sure there isn't a big collision um but it's it's fantastic and the racing here is going to be awesome because it's going to be um it's going to be tight there's all the boys all the boys from all the teams are really you know the top of the game and um yeah it's going to be pretty good to watch and as we can feel today and anyone locally living in portsmouth solon area cows the wind is strong here and it usually is always strong in portsmouth um that's obviously going to be a huge benefactor yeah i mean the british summer can throw anything at us and we've got to be ready for anything um but yeah if, if we get a big breeze day it's going to be um yeah, there's going to be some top speeds, top speeds on the water, and some um, some tight racing as well. You know, because all the teams are going to be fighting hard. Paul, what's your job on the boat, as it were? Where are you positioned? Do you change round, or have you all got your set positions that that's your skill? Yeah, no. Ben's obviously the helmsman, and I'm the guy that sits next to Ben and control the big wing sail. So, where with the extreme series and most yachts, you have a mast and a sail. We have basically a, a Boeing 747 wing above wow. us so <laughs> so it's my job to control that so i'm kind of the throttle man if you take it back to power boats and ben's ben's the uh, ben's the driver brilliant you put it completely into my perspective now i hope robin's listening so there is a there is a comparison to power boat racing and sailing um when you say you're sat next to him so you're not one of those guys charging across the sort of trampoline effect you're sort of you're, you're sat quite still and just making decisions with ben but no, not so much. I'm kind of in between, you know. I do a lot of running about as well, and of course we all have to cross the boat, so Ben does as well. But um, so I have to make sure the boat is going at full speed the whole time. But then I've also got to make sure that the lads in front of me, I back up the guys in front of me that do all the hard work. So um, yeah, I've got to pull a lot of ropes as well as making sure that the wing is perfectly trimmed above me and that the boat's yeah. going full speed. So I kind of I'd make a few decisions, but Ben makes most of them, and I kind of help him make those okay. decisions. Well, that was Paul Campbell James, the throttle man, or for sailors, the trimmer for the BAR team. Well, that's how he explained it to me, Robin. You know, we're putting it into layman powerboat terms. He's the throttle man. Ben is the driver. Yep. Um, and then there's the trimmer. So. Well, the trimmer is the throttle man. He's oh. the one who's trimming the sail and getting the maximum power out of the sail. So your equivalent, Shelley, is the man... T- on the gas. On the gas, yes, exactly right. <laughs> I wasn't sure of your technical expression for this. The H2O Show on BBC Radio Solent. This is H2O. I'm Robin Knox Johnston. And I'm Shelley Jory Lee. And this week the programme is in Southsea as the America's Cup World Series event draws to a close. Very sad, really, for all the people hoping to see the racing today, Shelley. But, you know, they set so much up down here. I mean, Southsea Common really is. Trans- well, it's changed so much to, to let this all happen. I know, as I was driving in this morning, I was like, oh, look at that, look at this. And I was, I was so excited and I couldn't believe it. We literally stepped one foot into the media centre and, a, and a, a picture came up on the screen, please evacuate this area immediately. And we're like, Neil and I were like, uh, 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 what? Yeah. And then we just couldn't believe it. And, um, yeah, I mean... Well, that's English weather for you. That's uh, why we live in England and have the joys of an English summer. It's a great shame for Portsmouth, because really they put in such a great effort for this. But, you mustn't forget, it's coming back again next year. Yes. Maybe we'll have a proper July then. Well, if anything, if yesterday was anything to go by, from what I've learnt from everybody, well, I'm, I'm down here for three days next year already. I've already booked it off. It's in my diary for next year already. Well, despite that, I mean, yesterday we had 52,000 spectators down here, 2,200 boats on the water. I mean, that's a phenomenal number. That is, that, it's amazing. I would have liked to have just seen that spectacle just to see 2,000 boats on the Solent. I mean, you know, we're, we're, getting, we're getting close to cow sailing week, aren't we? <laughs> well, that's more, more boats than do the Round the Island race. Amazing. Fantastic. Well, the team on the water are top-class athletes, and they are trained as such. Their workout regime, their diet, their whole lifestyle is so strictly controlled. Ben Williams is head of strength and conditioning, or in layman terms, he's actually the team's personal trainer, and he is a villain, I'm, I'm telling you. So what does that actually involve? I mean, it encompasses quite a lot more than that. We have a very integrated programme. 
um, that covers a lot of a lot of different aspects to what we're trying to achieve with the athletes, um, as in availability, health, um, their actual ability to produce power. So what, what do you actually put them through? I mean, apart from actually getting them into the gym and making them pump iron, what else do you do with them? So first and foremost, we look at availability. You can have the fittest athlete on the planet, but if they're not available to be picked, then there's no point. So we look at, um, at health monitoring quite heavily. Every, every day we have a, uh, a program that the guys fill in and it gives us an indication of their general health. Uh, resting heart rate, how they feel, um, some subjective questions about um, how they how they uh, feel in readiness to train, whether they're sore, whether they've got signs of a cold. Um, so that's something we do daily. Um, and then in health monitoring, we do every uh, quarter of the year we do a 21 panel blood analysis, uh, and that gives us feedback on where they're sufficient deficient in their blood makeup uh, whether they've whether they're set, they've got good cell health or poor cell health and then that also feeds heavily integrated to develop their ability to to have good energy systems so our nutritionist Aidan Goggins um, he, he runs that side of things so I've got kind of five people on my team I've got myself Alex Hopson who's the second strength conditioning coach and a, a soft tissue therapist we've got Tony Wilson a consultant physio um, Doc Thompson, our consultant uh, GP, and we've got Aidan Goggins, our consultant uh, nutritionist. So we're as a team of five, we're 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 there to keep them healthy, keep them available. Um, on top of that availability program, um, or integrated into that availability program, we have a prehabilitation program. So every morning before we start training they go through a 30 minute mobility and personal therapy plan so each individual person has their own ability to move in different ways or their own snags that they endure from training you know some people's it's shoulders some people's ankles so we have a, a prehabilitation program for each individual athlete that is designed to prevent those niggles coming on through the hardship that we put them through in their in their further training so that, that, that is the groundwork of everything we do. Um, we look at availability. So are they healthy? Are they fed properly? Do they have the energy they need? And uh, are they uninjured? And if we can achieve those three things, first and foremost, we're in a, a good position because they're all extremely good sailors. That was Ben Williams, Ben Ainsley Racing's personal trainer, officially head of strength and conditioning. Shelley, do you train like that for your racing? Um, no, <laughs> basically. I did. Um, I had a personal trainer when I was racing competitively and he used to drag me into the gym three times a week and then I was supposed to run all the other days but quite honestly um, tried to avoid that at all cost. Um, but nothing like what Ben puts those guys through. I actually went into the gym with him the other day and um, he, he talked us through um, all what they were doing and we saw the, the practice grinding machines and then it's all computerised and there's a level you've got to keep up to and I mean... It, it, nowhere near it. it. To me, it didn't look humanly possible. Those guys are mean machines. Well, they're saying that they're getting so physically fit and strong that actually they will be stronger than anyone above 12 in the British rowing team. I, I think that you could put any of those athletes into the Olympics on a running track, um, uh, weightlifting... It, it was incredible what they were put through. And it's not just actual work in the gym. It's food. You know, they're even monitored if they've eaten chocolate the night before while they've been watching television. It was, it's serious stuff. Well, they couldn't have you in the team doing that because you'd eat chocolate all the time. Oh, I'd have failed years ago. The H2O Show on BBC Radio Solent. I'm Robin Knox Johnson. This week, we're in South Sea at the America's Cup World Series event. Well, very sad, Shirley, for all the people who made the effort to come down today, but a lot of people did. Well, apparently they were queuing for, for miles, that's probably an exaggeration, but they were queuing a long, long way back yesterday just to even get in, in the beautiful sunshine. And then today, when we were driving in, although it was blowing a hoolie, pouring with rain, there were still people filing in today. And then just to, just to have got up and made the effort, got out of your bed on a Sunday morning in really horrible weather, and then to be turned away is... I, I do feel for everybody, and I really feel for the organisers. I mean, you know, as you said earlier, so much effort has been into this. The build-up of it from the weeks, you know, I've been listening to it on the radio, I've been seeing the posters, and 
you know, getting excited myself. And, and you know, we have sort of have a, a very inside view, Robin. I mean, you were even a VIP. You even got right in the front. <laughs> Well, if you have been here or you've watched the TV coverage closely, you may have seen a couple of unusual ribs taking the Ben Ainsley racing boats in and out of their headquarters. Um, amazing. They were designed and built by students at City College Marine Skills Centre in Southampton. And to find out a bit more, a few months ago, Neil Sackley went to Wollstone to see them being built. Darren Patton is the Composites Tutor at the Skills Centre. It's made of uh, glass fibre and a bio-resin as well, so a sustainable product, a sycamine product that's green epoxy 56, and that is 50% uh, bio-content, so in partnership with 11th Hour, uh, Ben Ainsley's partner, we've researched the materials that we could come up that were sustainable. So glass fibre, we have PET foam core as well to make the bulkheads and longitudinal internal structure. Part of the, the makeup of this is uh, recycled bottles and uh, of course it's 100% recyclable as well. So. Well this is just the hull and then obviously the decking goes on top of that. We have, yes and the deck is comprised again of PET foam core and also uh, within that uh, we've again we've used the, the bioresin and we've also used a, uh, a natural fibre in there as well and that's part of uh, reducing the impact uh, the footprint of the, of the boats as well. So. Uh, how, how big is she? 6.35 metres in total without the tubes attached. So. Yeah. so they're about half the size of the foiling boats that they're going to be using in the World Series oh, yes, then? Yes, indeed, yes, yes. Now here, about two-thirds of the way down, is something that you very rarely see in a hull of a rib, and that's a hole in the middle, because actually yes. they're not having outboard motors. No, they're not, and the reason for that, then there's no uh, chance of any external damage. Um, there's nothing exposed externally on the rib that can damage the America's Cup boats, so that's that, and also for manoeuvrability. So they're not built for speed. You probably go around in circles, um, but... Uh, they're built for manoeuvring sideways movement and to, and to not damage that boat at all. So everything's protected. Uh, tell me about the people who have been working on it, because it's, you've got apprentices and full-time students. Yes, absolutely. We're trying to involve as many people as possible. So we have first years who straight from school, um, also apprentices up to the age of 21, also, and some full-time students that are more mature as well. So we've had a really good range of people on it. Well, actually working on the boat at the moment is uh, Danielle Thomas. And uh, D Daniel, you're, you're an apprentice from Green Marine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just t tell us exactly what, uh, what you've been doing on here. Because I only do one day a week, which is Monday. Unfortunately, like, more stuff on the boat has happened, but I haven't been here. So I've been building maybe the bulkheads or something like that, and, like, the components. So if you're coming here once every week, you, you, you must see changing every, every time you come here yeah i know every time you come in it's made like, loads of progress um but it's unfortunate that i haven't been able to play such a big part in it well this project that you're working on at the moment uh, first time out in anger should we say is going to be end of july in portsmouth and are you going to be in south sea watching it with a, a little bit of pride and maybe a tear in your eye um i wish i could have but i'm a dinghy racer so i'm actually in the world championships in japan oh fantastic <laughs> yeah what class uh four twenties yeah no i would really love to go and see it but sadly i can't <laughs> Well, Gary Fisher is the learning manager here at the Marine Skills Centre. And this association with Ben Ainsley Racing, that can only be a good thing. Yes, yeah, hopefully in the long term, uh, we're looking at hopefully a partnership. Um, probably not a boat build every year from them, uh, but certainly this has been instrumental to us in our curriculum. Um, the boats that we've built this year have, have really lent themselves to the curriculum, to the student experience and their destinations. So we're looking at building a boat of some sort now every year moving forwards. And for the apprentices and the students to be working on such a high profile programme like this, what a start. Yeah, absolutely awesome for most of them. Um, you know, Green, Danny from Green Marine, um, she's working in that, that sort of sphere anyway. But for the full time students, you know, the ability to put that on their CV they've worked on a boat which has now been used by BAR um, it's a tangible project it's an awesome concern you know for the for the UK and for the, the maritime industry um, yeah absolutely fantastic opportunities well these ribs that are being built um, they're pretty much a unique design we know of a couple that have been produced bespoke um, for the, the last uh, America's Cup bid um, but yeah it's a, a new design one that's unproven almost
just having a quick look underneath this one, I was expecting to see some, uh, some ribs, uh, but actually it's uh, c completely smooth. What you would normally expect to see on a rib are the chines to provide the lift to get the vessel up out of the water. Um, this one doesn't plane, so the ribs are purely there for buoyancy and also for stability. Um, it's a very flat surface underneath because it just doesn't need to move anything greater than sort of six or seven knots. But I guess actually they've been built for a specific purpose and that is almost like to, to be like a tugboat. So they're not built for comfort or speed. No, that's exactly it. Um, you know, so the speeds are going to be sort of three to four knots. Uh, it's never going to get up on the plane. You wouldn't open the throttle to full. Um, so, yeah, you know, just, just sort of trotting around in the harbour, going from, from Canberra out into the Solent shouldn't be any problems whatsoever. Gary Fisher from the Marine Skills Centre in Walston talking to Neil Sackley about the docking ribs that have been designed and built by the students of the college for Ben Ainsley Racing. And you can see a picture of the rib under construction on our programme page for today, bbc.co.uk slash Solent. Robin, did you see um, did you see these ribs? They're amazing. Well, I've heard they've got the engine in the middle. Yeah. You see, the problem with towing or manoeuvring is modern tugs the Vorschneider type thing, it's, it's all central, so the tug can rotate, and this means they're so much more manoeuvrable. The danger with tugs was, if they got sideways on when towing, they could be what was called girded, and actually capsized. So if you can really pivot and manoeuvre, you can make sure that you're never that vulnerable to a pull by the tow, if you like. So it's a very clever idea these students have come up with. It is. I mean, I, it, in very layman terms, it's like a great big rubber ring with an engine in the middle. So, I mean, obviously, you know, you don't want to whack your engine or your propeller against these amazing boats. I don't think Ben would be very happy with that. Um, and, and now you've got this a great big buffer all around you and it can just do anything. It, it, was, it was really very clever. I was, I was very impressed. One of the most exciting results of Ben Ainsley Racing basing themselves in Portsmouth has been the Portsmouth Sailing Project. It's a joint initiative between their charity, the 1851 Trust, the Andrew Simpson Sailing Foundation in Weymouth and Portland and the Portsmouth Sailing Club. And it aims to get a thousand youngsters out on the water during the holidays. The scheme was launched last week. Sir Robin has been chatting to some of those behind the project. Alistair Acas is from the 1851 Trust. We were always determined to use the inspiration of the America's Cup coming to Portsmouth to get young people sailing and Portsmouth Sailing Club, our neighbours, actually came to us with a proposition which was perfect. It was exactly what we wanted to see in Portsmouth, which was to get uh, first-time novice sailors out on the water on the very, very same stretches of water as the, um, as the uh, AC-45s. So I think uh, you're, you're getting involved in this, so I actually gave it a lot of credibility, but with other people we needed to talk to to get some of the assistance to make this really happen. Yeah, we were aware that we uh, we were aware that it was a great project for us, but in terms of delivery, we certainly needed partners. So the club was absolutely crucial, uh, and then we approached Andrew Simpson Sailing Foundation. So there's a lovely paradox in that uh, in just a few days, uh, Ian Percy and Ben will be challenging one another, uh, and the teams will be challenging one another for the 35th America's Cup. Uh, but here they've come together uh, for the common good and uh, actually it's a, it's a fantastic marriage of two great charities with a club that's incredibly supportive and, um, and we couldn't have done it without them actually. Yes, what's so important about that is that you cannot run a try-to-sail event unless you've got the boats and unless you've got properly trained instructors and the safety equipment there. So having those two charities involved in this has meant that we've been able to get the boats and, of course, bring in a lot of trained instructors. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've been hugely overwhelmed with, um, with applications for instructors on this programme, which I think is, uh, speaks volumes for uh, this being a very desirable programme and a, a desirable place to sail. So we've got a fantastic, we were a spoil for choice in terms of instructors, uh, both local and those that have come from further afield. Um, and I think actually, uh, just on the, the back of the first couple of sessions, the instructors themselves have have just thoroughly enjoyed their time on the water with these kids. Um, and as I say, uh, these are novice sailors, first time sailors in the main. So uh, it's been a really transformative experience for both the kids and the instructors, I think. How many youngsters can you push through this program and this first attempt at it? So we're aiming high with a thousand, putting a thousand uh, people on the water from Portsmouth and the surrounding area. Uh, and within a, within a week of the programme opening online, we had uh, over 300 bookings. So uh, I'd love to come back to H2O, Robin, and, and, and tell you that we were oversubscribed and, uh, and looking to extend the programme. So uh, that would be a great position to be in. So uh, hopefully all the listeners and uh, spectators 
over the World Series will be inspired to um, to book their free place. And I should stress, it's a free place and a half day session. So it's um, more than a taster. I don't like the word taster. This is a real immersion into the sport. As you said um, earlier, Alistair, this wouldn't have worked without the cooperation of the Portsmouth Sailing Club. Now, Dave Lloyd, you're a, you've been a member of this club since you were born almost, haven't you? <laughs> Uh, yes, I seem to have uh, grown up within it. There's, uh, my, uh, my young son is uh, now, in fact, hopefully, uh, well, he's going to have a place on this. He's uh, 10 years old, so he fits uh, perfectly into the criteria. Um, it's, it's a very exciting um, prospect for the club because uh, it will introduce so many people from the Portsmouth area to sailing that just wouldn't normally have the chance. And we particularly want to see this grow in the future and provide opportunities for those that uh, like it going forward so that they can partake in some of the club's existing activities um, which take place Tuesday evenings, Thursday evenings and weekends during the summer and right up to Christmas in small keel boats and bigger boats as well. Well, as you know, one of the first things I did when I moved to Portsmouth was put my name down to join the club. And I have to say, it's one of the most friendly clubs I've ever joined. But also, of course, it's very active in sailing and it, it's open really to anyone who's got the enthusiasm to go sailing. Yes, uh, I mean, we, we, uh, we have uh, about 300 members at the moment, um, but there's still a bit of room for some more. We're not the biggest clubhouse in the, in the world, in Old Portsmouth, but uh, we are a very forward-thinking club and want to increase our sailing membership. We did suffer a spell where uh, the social membership was higher than the sailing membership some sort of 15 years ago or so, but now it's very much the balance has been redressed and the sailing membership is very much on the up and is uh, the vast majority of the club now. Uh, Jim Page, you're, the, you're, you're head of sailing really at this time aren't you and um, I've seen you out there in your victory frequently, in fact I've sailed with you. I mean to what extent have you got involved with this? Well I, my involvement is as sailing secretary, I'm not uh, the, the head of sailing but I'm the, the secretary that tries to get the sa as many members sailing as, as possible and uh, I'm particularly interested that we are hosting the uh, project because we are over endowed with members my age and uh, which I won't tell you but uh, well into uh, OAP status uh, we need many more younger members and this is a huge hope for us that this project will rub off and some of the, the children that take part will want to join us. Jim Page from the Portsmouth Sailing Club telling Sir Robin about the Portsmouth Sailing Project. And if you'd like to find out more and sign up, look for Portsmouth Sailing Project online. Robin, what a great initiative. Do you know, Shelley, there might be some youngster somewhere in Portsmouth, between 9 and 13, never been on a boat before, and they've got a talent. There may be a Ben Ainsley out there, so we're hoping we might find that talent so Britain continue to rule the waves. This is the first event in the 35th America's Cup campaign, and the final, of course, will be in Bermuda in 2017. Sir Ben and his team have made no secret of their aim to bring the Cup home. So if and when they do, will Portsmouth be the base for the next competition? Who decides where the final is heard, held and when? Well, Andy Hinley is the Chief Operating Officer for Land Rover Ben Ainsley Racing. So when you win, you become the next defender, and everyone just refers to the person who's won it as the defender. So the defender gets to choose everything. They get to choose where, they get to choose when, they get to choose in what boat, they get to choose the rules. It's their, it's their game. They get, to, they get to control the game. We're now playing the game on Oracle Team USA's rules. We want to win it, bring it back here and play it on, under our rules. Um, so part, when we do that, when we win it, bring it back and go, right guys, it's all up to us now and you're going to play by our rules, yep. can we hold it in Portsmouth? Yes, we, we believe we can, but the, the biggest problem we face is space. Mm. Now we've built this fantastic building in the, in the camera, a beautiful location in the heart of Portsmouth, but we're one team. Now at the next America's Cup in Bermuda, there are six teams and we hope that after that, when, when it comes back here, there will be seven, eight, nine, ten teams. And we're trying to bring the cost down of the cup. We get smaller boats and everyone's working towards bringing costs down in general. But the, the team still needs space, space yeah. to operate. And not, not for a couple of weeks. And when we go to Bermuda in 17, we're there for ten months. So there's an advance party, then the main party goes for eight months, and then there's a pack-up. So ten months of space is quite an ask in a crowded 
city environment. Now, it's certainly possible, but we have to work out with the council, can we get that space for that length of time? The positivity for the council is, it's like having 10, eight, nine, however many teams there are, and Ainsley Racing teams in your city. You can't even begin to believe or feel that you know the money that's going to come in. The, the, in the, I mean, for the economy, it's huge. It is. It would be enormous. So it's, it, it's multiplying our team by five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten for that. Let's say it's a year. They come, but actually, it might be longer than that because mm. some of the teams in Bermuda this time have already. They're already there. We're in 15, the Cup's not until 2017, they're there for years. So they've, they've actually just made, they've just moved the whole team and made camp and home in Bermuda, yes. practicing, ready yes. for 2017. Yes, now wow. if that happened here, <laughs> you, could have, you could have all those teams here for years, but we need the space. We've got lots of water, we all just the... need lots of, we need lots of floating pontoons and buildings. Well, not necessarily buildings, but so that they will build their own temporary bases. So it's actually just, it's just land. There's just an opportunity, you just need land. And the sailing is fantastic here. Our sailing team have already commented the difference to get out into the settlement, into open water from here, it's already made an impact. And we've only been operating out of here for two weeks. So um, it's made a massive difference to us. I mean, at the end of the day, we've got the sailing capital if i could honestly say it. i mean cows week yeah. round the island race it's literally just over there and that is legendary across the world um you know i mean i don't even bother telling anybody i live in southampton i just tell them i live opposite cows whenever i'm anywhere in the world so you know it is the perfect area and how fantastic to bring it back yeah um, and that will increase the legend of, of the sail that this this legendary sailing area and, yeah. and we'll just we'll just add to that legend that was Andy Hinley, the Chief Operating Officer for Land Rover Ben Ainsley Racing, on bringing the Cup back home and to Portsmouth. As Andy was explaining, an event like this takes up a lot of room. So where are the visiting teams making their bases here? The Royal Navy to the rescue, here's Commodore Jeremy Rigby. Oh, it's fascinating, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's a really interesting piece of some pretty high-tech uh, maritime technology uh, being moved around, but uh, I think it's moved on a bit from the age of sail that we see uh, in the good ship Victory. Now, the Royal Navy are, are playing quite a part with the, the visiting teams here this weekend. Well, it was very clear from the outset that for Portsmouth to get a winning bid out there, it needed some really good facilities, not just for Ben Angley Racing, but also for the five competing teams that would be coming here. And uh, chatting to Team Origin and working with Portsmouth City Council, uh, it became very clear from the outset for the Royal Navy that we should make available the facilities, the waterfront that we've got, and put some space out there so that the team bases can put can bring themselves over, set themselves up and um, give us a world-beating location for the owners, runners of America's Cup to say, yep, Portsmouth and the Solent is a place to come. I mean, this place normally is incredibly busy. All along here it normally are, are warships. How did you manage to get them in? Well, first of all, with notice, anything is possible. Uh, actually, the dates have fallen in uh, with some timing when we've got a lot of Portsmouth ships are out on the operations around the world rather than Plymouth ships. So we've got Portsmouth ships in the Gulf, Caribbean, down in the South Atlantic uh, and around and about. But more importantly, uh, the timing fitted with when I had just cleared quite a lot of this jetty space to start work on them ready for the arrival of HMS Queen Elizabeth next year. So uh, the timing actually couldn't have been more convenient. And for the teams coming in, they've probably got a clearer space to set up than they normally would. So in layman's terms, are we looking at five of the six teams effectively having their pits here? Absolutely, and that's a really good analogy. This is the sort of Formula One pit stop. Uh, these are really high-tech, sophisticated vessels now racing around there and a lot of fine tuning is going on so you'll see some very large marquees uh, which have got in each of them about four 20-foot ISA containers full of all the equipment workshops and uh, sort of clever equipment for analysis uh, set up there so as to get the winning edge over the other teams. The people of Portsmouth this weekend, they're going to see something absolutely unique right on their doorstep off, off South Sea. But for the teams that are coming, they're being housed in somewhere that is absolutely unique. They, there can be nowhere else in the world that boasts the history and the heritage that this site we're standing on has. Well, I think it's uh, caught all of the visiting teams uh, 
attention really coming in. Uh, it's not just that they've got the backdrop of Victory Mary Rose, but actually they're in the heart of a working modern naval base with warships toing and froing and further along the jetties from them and uh, all the security that you would imagine going with that. And it can't have been an accident that each one of these teams is going to have to go to their race areas past Ben Ainsley Racing's headquarters with that huge Union Jack on the front. And it's no coincidence that the French are on Victory Jet either. <laughs> now, once the racing and once the event gets underway this weekend, the Royal Navy are playing an important role out at sea as well? Well, very much so, because this is the Portsmouth Dockyard port that they wanted to operate in to get the racing close up to the beach so the spectators could see it. Uh, in some pretty congested waters that uh, your listeners in the Solent will know, uh, it comes down to the, the Navy's Queen Harbour Master to work with the ferry companies, the international port, and to work as much as we can to deconflict so that uh, the course which will be settled on the day when we know where the wind is can be there at the exact slot that the organisers want so as to get maximum TV coverage for live transmission and uh, not interfere with the holiday makers on their ferries or the trade that is plying around here anyway. So. Royal Navy's coordinated all of that and we also have a number of warships and vessels providing security and marshalling activity. Wonderful PR. Well you say that it's great for the UK PLC isn't it is where we're coming from. Um, we're a maritime nation you couldn't get any more significant cutting edge maritime event than this AC45 racing and you know the Royal Navy it's based its spiritual home here in Portsmouth so the right thing to do is to be up there and making sure it's a great success for United Kingdom and for Portsmouth. Our Commodore Jeremy Rigby talking to Neil about their role in this weekend's event. Actually the Navy have been brilliant actually, making parts of the dockyard available so we could bring all the other teams in and allow them to have a base within the naval dockyard. I, I heard this morning when I was chatting to Leslie earlier, um, and as we heard from her earlier in the show, um, she said that everybody had to meet this morning and, and, and make this quite drastic decision that racing couldn't go ahead. And she said the Royal Navy were there, um, you know, Harbour Master, everybody sat down at the table and, and just brilliantly got the job done. And that's what I love about Britain. When, when basically it all goes to poop, we all stick in and get the job done and she said the decision was made very clearly very precisely and that was it and she said everyone has been so helpful uh, it was very well handled actually because everyone bought into the decision but you know i mean having actually something like this in the naval base so it's un unheard of that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago no and i'm surprised it happens now with you know i mean safety and security is even stronger now than it's ever been so um you know, I think that's. Uh, I think it's just a very good testament to our country. And the security we have. Now, what's it like on board one of these fantastic boats? Duncan Kennedy drew the long straw and took the water on the AC-45. The Solent has never seen anything like it. The flying boat of Ben Ainsley. Soaring and skimming, this is a life on top of the ocean wave. And the first time in 164 years, America's Cup has come to British waters. This phenomenal vessel rides high on carbon fiber foils. Just listen to the sound of speed. It's skippered by Ben Ainsley, Britain's Olympic gold medalist, who last time helped the Americans win. But not anymore. These AC 45 can travel at around 50 knots out here on the open sea, even though they weigh more than a ton. No wonder they're called the Formula One of ocean racing. The idea is to be up out of the water, foiling along to minimize the drag, which is why they're more like a plane than a boat. Can Britain win the America's Cup? Yeah, Britain can win the America's Cup. We need to win it. We've never won it in 164 years. Uh, it's going to be a, an incredibly tough challenge, but believe me, we would not be doing this if we didn't think we could win it. And Everett crosses the line with the American yacht slightly ahead. He's right. Not since it began on the Solent in 1851 has Britain won it. The crew are on their toes all the time, working with a will that makes for success. 
But now, with this brand new headquarters in the heart of Portsmouth Harbour and his brand new team around him, Sir Ben believes he can slice through all competition and bring the oldest international trophy in world sport back home. Duncan Kennedy reporting from on board Ben Ainsley's racing AC45 in the Solon. Robin, I want a go. Do you know, these boats here, they can go almost as fast as I have speed in the Cows to Key Pabot race. I, I, you know I've never been a fan of sailing, but I have to say, I love the extreme 40s. This is, I, I really would love to race with these guys or just have a go. I mean, I'd never even come close to their fitness regime, um, but I do think we need a girl on the team. Just, just saying, just saying. Well, it's always nice to have a girl on the team. You know, you dress up, put on a pretty dress. I love it. But, uh, well, this America's Cup World Series event has finished here in Portsmouth. And the results are out. Uh, the winner, I'm very pleased to say, is Land Rover BAR. That's Ben Ainsley's team with 19 points. Second, interestingly, is Emirates Team New Zealand, with the runners-up in the last America's Cup. And third, with 16 points, is Oracle Team USA, who were the winners last time. They're the holders. Fourth, Group Armour Team France. Watch them. I think they're coming up fast. Uh, the Japanese team, SoftBank Team Japan, 13 points for fifth. And Artemis Race with our only in Percy skipping was sixth with 11. But it's very early days. There's a lot of training to go on and a lot of improvement to come. Jimmy Spittle is the skipper of Defenders Oracle Team USA. Jimmy, second and fourth. Um, compared to the America's Cup final last time, this must feel like winning. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think at this point we weren't even at zero. We are in the negatives. So, uh, yeah, it's nice to have some positive points. <laughs> there must have been a point where you saw Ben Ainsley racing going out in front and thought, actually, I want him on board here again. <laughs> no, not really. No, uh, we're more than happy to go head-to-head -head with Ben. H how important is this? I think it's important for all the teams, you know. I mean, this is... Everyone wants to start off the first event on the front foot. Everyone would like to post a good result. And the fact is, this racing counts. You know, we're fighting for a bonus point in the America's Cup. And we want it. We want to start 1-0 up. Have you had a chance to get over to the Isle of Wight yet and to see the Royal Yacht Squadron? No, not yet. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a big man on Royal Yacht Clubs, to be honest. <laughs> I'd rather What's just, that mug? <laughs> I'd rather just go racing. It was. It was. Yeah. <laughs> From here, the campaign continues. Sir Ben Ainsley. Three more events this year in Bermuda and Gothenburg and later in New Zealand. And next year, 2016, um, more mainland US events as well as another event back here in Portsmouth, uh, which then build up to the America's Cup finals itself in Bermuda 2017. And that America's Cup World Series now counts towards the final scores of the qualifying process. So it's, uh, we're, we're racing for um, some serious points here. Well, thank you to everyone for making this show possible. And if you miss any of our programmes, there are hundreds of clips from the show to listen back to on our website. Well, next week, we're at Pool Lifeboat Station as they mark their 150th anniversary.